put the he uh, headphones on over there and check my my glass. I don't trust where Damon was sitting. <laughs> I don't know where you sit. Well, normally I sit at least like uh, tucked into the table. Um, oh. You know, like a normal person. I don't <laughs> sit way the hell back there. And you weren't even like oh, yeah. sitting back there on the edge of your seat. You were just sitting back there. Oh. Uh, I'm talking. Dan you can hear me. Morning, everybody. Doing a little bit of a uh, last minute mic check here. Looks like uh, I might have to adjust my sitting position. Fun facts with Timothy. Okay, fine. While we are waiting, let's uh, let's hit up a fun facts. Yeah, the, I no. Fun fact of the day. Uh, but if I scoot in and move away from my white mic, you can at least see my face now. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, here's a fun fact. Oh, as soon as Peter gets out of the way. Thank Jesus, you. Holy cow. Did you know platypuses don't have nipples? They're plat pies. Yeah, well, when there's more than one, but I like the platypuses. It sounds better. Uh, the milk actually oozes from their uh, skin a little bit like sweat and then kind of collects in their fold so their uh, babies can drink it. But it is wildly antibacterial, so it's pretty safe for them to do that. Now you know. All right, sweet. <laughs> we got that in there. Let's, uh, let's get into it a little bit while uh, Peter is making himself a little bit of a breakfast. Uh, hey, so breakfast? Always. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely get him some breakfast. Some I breakfast. could have got everybody breakfast, but that would have been nice, and I'm just not about that. Um, anyway, Genus News, what we got going on right now, uh, we did tap two <laughs> new beers. We uh, tapped a grapefruit IPA. This is the one we do with uh, guys out at our local Air Force Base, uh, Fairchild Air Force Base. Uh, it's a Shell 77 grapefruit IPA, and it is tasting pretty darn good, um, in all honesty. It's tasting a lot more grapefruit than hop from uh, the hops than the uh, grapefruit powder when we added in, which I love. That's great. It's nice, crispy, not over sweet. Uh, would you, have you tried that yet? Your juice? No. No, no, no. The grapefruit the IPA, the Shell oh. 77 on right now. Yeah. You do the welcome intro for the cuts. For the cuts? Yeah, they'll be like, welcome oh. everybody. Mm. Well, I was just kind of trying to go over little things until you got over here. All right, fine. Here we go for the cuts. Welcome to Genus Brewing. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this fine wow. Sunday morning. And for all you know, it's beautiful out there. Anyone in Spokane, silence. Uh, we're having a great time this morning. We got Damon on here. He is the owner of No Drought Brewing Company. He's, uh, you know, a pretty cool guy. We like him a whole lot. He also loves animals. <laughs> and Ryan is his best friend. Ryan is his best friend. Oh, sure. man. Sure. So, uh... Back to your question, though, I have had your grapefruit juicy or grapefruit IP, and it's, yeah. it's amazing. It's good. It's really good. It's really nice. Uh, we enjoy that. Grapefruit grisette out now. We talked about that a while ago. That was delicious. It definitely wasn't a mistake. Uh, Did it on purpose. It was awesome. It, it's actually really nice. So we got that going on. We got a new juicy in the tanks. We're going to do a tropical stout here pretty soon. Juicy in the tank. Shorty, what you drank? Uh, yes. Beer. She drinks wow. beer. Um, you know, so that's going on here. Uh, what else? Do we put something else on new? I think somebody made a comment of who's gonna, what's gonna happen first, either a sexual innuendo from Peter or a long rant from Tim. Who won? It already <laughs> happened. Yeah. We, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Actually, over. I think the sexual innuendo it came from me. Oh. You know, I like the uh, platypus instead oh, of platypi. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's much. How more much fun pineapple for a juicy and secondary? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. All of it. Uh, a quart of pineapple juice. For those of you tuning into the podcast, welcome. If this is your first time listening, we do this uh, based on our Sunday morning live streams, which happen on YouTube at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time every single week. So if you want to watch this live, go ahead and join us there. 
And for those of you who don't know, the format of this goes, we do some, some ramblings at the very beginning. Uh, we talk about some genus brewing news, stuff going on in the tap room or in the beer industry in general. Then we go into a style of the week where we BJCP break down our favorite malts, hops, and yeasts to use within a style of beer. And then we go into two discussion topics, which today's will be uh, something about how to not suck at starting a brewery, and then uh, <laughs> something about how to scale up slash down your batches if you are a home brewer looking to go big, or if you are stealing batches from a brewery and trying to make it fit your homebrew scale. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to do that uh, uh, fantastically. Yeah, that's a... There's, there's some really great stuff on here. I'm reading this for the first time right now, <laughs> live. Well, Tim already mentioned that we've got a new grapefruit IPA on and a new grapefruit grisette, both of which are fantastic. Oh, yeah. The uh, grapefruit grisette, what did you use in this? Uh, I used the Pilsner. Oh, that's a mistake. <laughs> the grapefruit grisette for a Michelada is just oh, phenomenal. Throw a little bit of fermented hot mm -hmm. sauce in there for the extra funk, and it's just the best thing you'll ever have. Um, you know, uh, beyond that, we did throw on an IPA from Paramore Brewing Company. They're out there trying to capture that golf game with uh, IP, I put awesome. Um, yeah. Oh, you can't see that. I'm off screen. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty darn delicious. <laughs> Those guys are awesome. Give them a, uh, you know, check it out. If and they do, yeah, around. they do put excellence. They, they do put They're almost as good as golf as me, which is almost as good as golf as Damon wants to be. That I is that entirely was true. I was about to make a comment, but I was just going to let you roll with it because I knew you were going to make that comment. Yeah, yep. that's just, yeah, that's how it goes. It's not going to happen. <laughs> You'll never beat me. Uh, yeah. uh, in some more exciting news, we got a uh, gift box from Tavor. If you guys don't know who Tavor is, Tavor is a beer delivery box uh, where they take some beer um, straight from craft breweries around the country and they deliver it right to your door. So if you're looking for some excellent beer that you cannot find in your local area, we did a video where we tried some of those beers already. Um, that's yeah. going to be coming out on the Genus Not Brewing channel. So if you're not following that, go ahead and follow that. Um, we're going to drink some this morning because, you know, uh, beer. Beer. Um, and uh, there's probably going to be some more videos to come. They sent us a lot of beer, and I am very happy about <laughs> it. So. Yeah, it's pretty awesome actually getting beer from uh, all around the country and seeing what's going on in different places. You know, uh, local breweries are the best. We've uh, always said that. And unfortunately, because of distribution lines uh, and freshness, it's not always viable to get some of these beers. And these guys are providing a great opportunity for us to try beers we would have no opportunity to try otherwise. Uh, well, there's some fun ones on that video. I'm not going to give any spoilers because you need to go watch it. But there are some amazing flavors that we just didn't even expect to go into beers, uh, at least in one of them. Daniel asks, is it a sponsor? Uh, no, not yet. But if you guys work hard enough, I'm sure you can make them sponsor us. And I would love to get free beer. I would, I would, take, I would take the free beer every, every other week or something like that just as the sponsorship. I wouldn't need any money, but I would take all the free beer. So yeah. what we have drank has been super, super good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's been great. Uh, with that, I mean, shall we open one? Uh, we probably should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we should. Sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> why, don't have, definitely. why don't we have multiple things going on? And while he's opening one of those, I think we can probably safely lean into our beer of the week. Bum, 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 beer of the week. Woo, woo. Yeah. Woo. How did you guys that like the triplets? That was good. I think we got oh, the. Uh, like, yeah. Woo. Four, I was trying to be just last. Like that was the last comment. Oh, come on. I it mean, was, it, it was, was four part harmony, though. It was better than my so first good. time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I bet she yeah, remembers remember that. Time. Yeah, Damon still hasn't had this first time. <laughs> Last week? Well, we um, you just, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> that was your, you, and you're welcome for that. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> uh, the beer of the week this week is a Roush beer. A Roush beer so uh, was a BJC, <laughs> BJCP specific style in the 2008 guidelines. It was... 22B back then, back in the day, something like that. Oh, 22A. 20, oh, 22A. 22A. Uh, but it's no longer a uh, um, no longer a BJCP style guidelines. It kind of just folds into classic smoked beer. Is the new guidelines, which is like 32B. Lisa, who's loud? L good mo I good think morning, it was just ladies. A song. <laughs> Uh, or was it just the song? It's probably the song. Okay. Keep going, Peter. All right. Uh, after, after Lisa, there was a, a gnome brewing that said, good morning, ladies. And that just <laughs> reminded me of, uh, you know, some little Afro man. Uh, yeah. Cool yeah. 45. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Rouch Beer. Rouch Beer is a, a classic smoke style beer oh. that kind of falls into, um, it falls into more of a light sessionable ale category, uh, but it has a pretty broad, uh, broad overall 
um, range. Uh, it can go anywhere from 1050 to 1057 uh, OG, so it's going to finish out in that sessionable, you know, five to six percent range. Um, it can be anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, IBUs. Not the IBUs really matter, um, but really what you're going for is you want the IBUs to be subtle enough that they don't overwhelm the smokiness. You're going for this is a smoked beer. Uh, and you want to have uh, this be basically a session. Well, I would call it basic, basically like a Kolsch, a Kolsch with smoke. Yeah, uh, I was going to go into that and actually say that uh, I personally prefer Roush beers on the cleaner, crisper side. So yeah. even though it is technically kind of a nail, I would treat it as a hybrid and treat it like a Kolsch. Give it that nice lagering period to get some super good crispiness coming out of it. And like Peter said, you're focusing on uh, the smoke here, and that's literally the name. Roush <laughs> beer means smoked beer. Mm. Like, you, that's what you're going for. Or any beer from Fluoride, guys. Yeah, that's also <laughs> actually 100% true. Um, and they're delicious, so we like it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, going into that, but this smoke, this sh the smoke shouldn't be overpowering on that either. It should be all about the smoke, but you are not eating ashes. You're not eating a charcoal piece. It's just that nice, really smooth, easy smoke that you want in your face hole all day long. And it's not a peated smoke, which is a really clear distinction. So oh, that, yeah. that peat smoke flavor, that's going to be too aggressive and too inappropriate. You want sweet smokiness. Um, I almost, for the malt of the week, I didn't put it, but I almost put mesquite malt from uh, Breeze, which is sweet and delicious. It is. But I didn't. Uh, uh, Damn, you want to go over the general uh, aroma and then overall impressions? Uh, for everybody wondering, we are drinking some Odd 13 Brewing uh, Q QDH, codename Superfan. This is uh, from Lafayette, Colorado. Citra, Simcoe, Equinot, Two Row, Golden Promise, Wheat, Dexatrin. Um, Call it Superfan because of all the free aminos. Yeah. Quadruple, dry hopped, uh, hazy IPA. There we go. Um, this is another thing I'll actually sell it, uh, say about uh, Tabor when we've started getting these beers. <laughs> They're stupidly fresh. Yeah. So yeah. that has been <clears throat> sweet, especially for these IPAs. They know what they're doing with the seven ounce IPAs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Go. Anyway, so aroma, uh, the Roush beer. Um, like they said, smoke and malt is going to be the main thing. Um, I think as well as not being overpowering on the smoke, on the taste, it, that's the same thing when it comes to the smell and the aroma of it. Uh, you kind of want to have that fine balance between the malt and the smoke itself. Uh, beechwood smoke is, uh, I guess, the most common or typical when it comes to this. And so you can kind of do it how you want, I guess. You can make it a little stronger or a little less. Um, but I, again, I think it just comes down to finding that right balance to where it's not too overpowering, but you still kind of sense that, oh, this has some smokiness to it. And the guidelines, I like that it says uh, it, it can be a little bit meaty and bacon-like because whenever I use yeah. uh, like any sort of Roush malt, especially the Breeze ones, when like the mesquite that I was telling you about or mm -hmm. the, uh, the cherry wood is like the super, uh, I call it meaty, but it's like a good meaty. It's like it feels like it just came off of a, a Traeger. Yeah, um, that's big. I mean, when we made a uh, Canadian bacon and pineapple pizza, yeah. we used the cherry wood to replicate that meaty. I'd say the beech wood is probably the least meatiest, be uh, excluding okay. peat malt. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, excluding peat malt, because that's just shouldn't be in Roush beers. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, select your level on that. That's really nice. Um, I malt, you know, you should also have, get some good malt character I I into this, too. This yeah. is, while everything is about the smoke, it needs to be supported. And you should have a little bit of malt character going on in the background as well. I'm um, oh. talking about the the beach book that actually leads into the malt of the week that I picked, which you know is also the very first thing listed in the uh, ingredients. Um, a German German Rausch malt. Uh, we like the Rausch malt from Best Malts, uh, which is exactly what it says in the pr projected ingredients that you want to be using. It's a uh, beechwood smoked Vienna type malt, so it's going to be a little bit darker than um, a classic pale malt or you know basic two row. Uh, the reason being, there is actually a little bit of extra kilning that goes on during the smoking process, this is, and so this. But malt is basically made like a standard pale malt or two row and then just through the smoking process it gets a little bit more cooked not a lot um, and so it gains some extra character so it ends up being in that uh, that vienna like range yeah uh, which i personally think is great getting that extra little bit of sweetness in there a little bit of extra um from it yeah, oh. it's delicious <laughs> And you uh, can use it up to 100%. So yeah. all, all these malts are not going to be overly smoky if you use them 100%. I personally don't like doing, doing that, but um, you can use these up to 
I would say if you, especially if you're going to use like actual Roush malt or the beech wood, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm saying that beech, uh, <laughs> if you're beech wood, uh, smoke <laughs> malt, if you're letting it lager for a long time or, uh, storing it, aging it, uh, conditioning it for an extended amount of time, you'll have far more success using a hundred percent than you would if you're drinking it fresh, fresh should probably not be a hundred percent, but you can do it and it still tastes great. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Going, uh, going on in there, like, oh, uh, I like this in the BJCP that the overall impression is Marzen Oktoberfest style beer with sweet, smoky aroma. Uh, I think that's entirely appropriate. It should mm-hmm. almost be a smoky, to me, almost smoky Vienna uh, is where I like it. Not quite as sweet as the Marzen Oktoberfest, but right in there. This should be a really nice, fine German beer with beautiful smoke over the top. I think if you've already made an Oktoberfest beer like a Marzen, I think that's a very, very good baseline to start to use that recipe as a guideline and then tweak that a little bit and adding the smoked malts uh, to make the Roush. They're going to be having mm-hmm. a lot of the Vienna style malts already in them as a base. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. kind of clean substituting a chunk of that out for yeah. Roush malt is a really easy way to just make that that shift. Uh, Brewmill Tony, um, it depends on who you're buying your standard smoke malt from. Uh, we'll go into that, but a German Rausch malt is generally used, uh, or generally a Beechwood smoke malt. Yeah, I know the one from Best Malts is Beech Malt, uh, or Beechwood. I believe the one from Weirman is, is as well, so uh, um, as far as I know. The, uh, yeah. I've, I've used that before, though. I've used a cherry smoked in, a, in the grates I made. I think it turned out oh, really man. well. I think it's got um, a lot of extra character to it. Yeah, it does, definitely. It's Which a, I like. It's a different flavor of smoke, yeah. 100%. The, be- the beech wood is a lot softer, and I think it's just kind of that nice, light touch of smoke. Or the cherry wood is a little bit more like, mm, you are drinking a great beer next to a smoker with some of the most delicious barbecue you'll ever have on it. It's kind of the impression I get. Yeast and the Beast had a great comment. Plata push the light <laughs> button, which I think is... It's a good, 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 good thing to do. Actually, uh, Tim Harstead, uh, you got a good one on there too. Stick to one or uh, blend them. You know what? That's up to you, man. Uh, you do what you like. Uh, Stick I to would... one smoked malt or blend them. There's people yeah. listening on the podcast that aren't reading the comments. Okay, fine, <laughs> whatever. For you people in uh, podcast land, you asked, uh, would you stick to one smoked malt or would you blend multiple? And in all honesty, blending multiple is a great way to get a different level of complexity into your beer. If you're talking about a traditional Roush beer, most of the time they're going to be 100% one. But, you know, how we feel about traditions, they're meant to be broken <laughs> or followed, depending on what you're doing. Uh but that's up to you, whatever flavor you like. If you like that nice softness, but you want just a little bit of like bacon or sweetness on the back end, uh, using the mesquite's gonna be beautiful. Uh, I've, know. Done, I've done even mesquite as like 30% of my grist and then uh, I kicked it with like, you know, one or 2% peated malt or heavy peated malt just oh, yeah. for that extra like, oh, that's really interesting smoke. Yeah, but there's ways you can play around with it. There's reasons to blend. If you're just making your first one, just don't. I mean, it's probably you're probably not going to know what smoke you're tasting. Yeah. So I would probably start with just going that classic German Roush malt. But if you are experienced with making a Roush beer and you know what the flavor of the base Roush that you have is, then I would maybe say try a little, you know, try a little, little peat smoke Peace in your beer. Smoke. Yeah. <laughs> a uh, little hint of mesquite if you need you need that yeah. extra mesquite. You know, they play around with it, experiment. That's why uh, brewing is amazing, is because you can make whatever flavor you like. All right, um, history. Let's go uh, a little bit into history. This is a uh, sp- uh, specialty of the city of Bamberg. That's fun to say, no, Bamberg. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, all right. In the uh, Franconian region. Of uh, Bavaria, Germany. Oh, here we go. Even uh, in here, Beechwood smoked malt is used to uh, make a mm-hmm. Marzen style amber lager. Mm-hmm. Um, so where it developed, Beechwood was traditional. But again, you know, break tradition. There we go. Um, Someone and, says, uh, Stefan Stoudemire said, also visit Bamberg in Germany. Yeah. Uh, also do that because you can probably get some really <laughs> awesome, delicious smoked beers. I think he's the one that said hello from Germany this morning. too. Ooh. Oh, so he might be nice. in Germany. So which if is, you, uh, I'm jealous. Have any inkling to do some international shipping? You know, we would love it. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. uh, Go ahead and say I'll take some. (laughs) Yeah. Send a few over or a few more over. Oh, greetings from Germany. Yeah, you're right. Right at the top. Yeah. Yeah. 
Where in Germany? Are you from Bamberg? That'd be awesome. That'd be really coincidental. That would be, actually. Yeah, be fantastic. Uh, you know? So, uh, yeah. That, um, that's uh, awesome there. So... Let's see. We went over ingredients. We went over history. We went over aroma, which kind of goes into flavor. There's really not a lot more to talk about there. Mm -hmm. uh, mouthfeel. The one thing that I'll add is, uh, it's, you know, it's gonna be medium body, medium to high carbonation. That high carbonation is gonna help push forward some smoke aromatics. Uh, but an important distinction is going to be uh, that it is uh, significant astringent phenolic harshness is not okay. So you do not want, and that's one of the reasons that uh, peated malt is going to be out of the question, uh, but you do not want um, a high phenol, high, um, you know, a high smoke that almost like it zaps you on your tongue as a sharp flavor. You want it to be that smooth, meaty smokiness, that round, almost sweet smokiness. Yeah. Uh, and that's the deal about this too. It's not like a, when you get a little bit of smokiness and stout and that's, it's that really kind of harsh almost ashy smoke from the black malt you're looking for a really nice soft malt i mean it almost is like a really good barbecue where the smoke is in there it's penetrated everything deep down into the meat uh, you can see the paint going into the meat there and it's absolutely delicious all right i'm sorry uh but it, it is like barbecue where you're just trying to get that really <laughs> nice soft smoke it's well in balance it's not like you literally rolled it in ashes this should be a complementary flavor uh in there and it, the body has a lot to do that it should not be astringent it should not be gritty in your mouth um i think somebody made a comment earlier that um, to do a, a bingo for you guys and every time you rant you, you have a square for you ranting and <laughs> yeah. like just going on a tangent and sexual and for you and sexual I, mean, go for it. I think it'd be better as a drinking game so yeah, it's yeah. somebody watching uh, definitely a drinking, a drinking game. game so drink um, every time if one of you guys wants to go ahead and make up a bingo board or a drinking game with rules and send them to us I promise you we will put those on at least one of our live streams if not, if not all of them uh, Benjamin Harris I love this analogy I, I, I actually use this quite a bit smell the smoke as you walk by the campfire instead of sticking your head into it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I normally say you're drinking a beer next to a fire. I personally you know? don't see any wrong, anything wrong with sticking your head inside of a fire. For the flavor, you don't want to be like licking the ashes of the fire in your beer. That's okay, but the sensation is, you know. Oh, well, it's nice it's, and warming. Exactly. Uh, it's a yeah, little toasty. Uh, you know what they say, That's, if you- You can you, have toasty in this beer. If you <laughs> build a man a fire, he's warm for a day. If you light a man on fire, he's warm for the rest of his life. <laughs> that is 100% true. Yeah. Uh, you can't argue with that. Uh, Thomas B. Um, <laughs> the, the kind of a uh, question phrased in here, the smoke. Uh, so what he's doing, uh, asking about in podcast land uh, is that he just made a Roush beer and the smoke is a bit underpowering, which uh, I 100% believe in Roush malts, you can use a lot less than you, uh, you would expect. The smoke is very soft. Uh, he asked... Uh, Phrased in a question, you wouldn't expect it to get more smoky over time. And that's 100% true. It's not going to get more smoky over time. But as it conditions out, flavors will more equalize. Sharp flavors will drop off and you start to get more subtle characters coming out of it. Uh, one of the reasons lagers are known, uh, so nice, fine, and crispy because of that. So you'll get an enhanced flavor coming out of that, but not necessarily a stronger flavor coming out of it. All right, let's uh, move on to my favorite hop of the week. Um, mm. And I chose uh, Tim's second favorite hop of all time, which is Mount Hood. <laughs> Actually, well, depending. It ties with Columbus. I yeah. will say that. Like, I, mm. There are probably more times I would use Mount Hood than Columbus, but I just you know, also love Columbus. Mount Hood. Mount Hood is an amazing hop. I think this is an underrated hop in far too many styles, personally. Uh, so... What is Mount Hood? I mean, wh where did we get this? Uh, Mount Hood is a derivative from one of the nobles. Is it Hallertau? Hallertau. Uh, Hallertau uh, and bred, uh, bred and grown over in, um, in Yakima. Uh, so basically based on terroir differences and different breeding. Um, and for those who don't know, when hops are bred, they're bred in certain plots. Uh, and they have like a buffer zone. Um, so you have the main plot of the hop you're trying to grow. Then you have a buffer zone, which is like trying to you know keep all the the sex robots away from the hop plants because you don't want cross breeding uh, and then you've got the outside fields and that's how hops are grown um, but mount hood is specifically uh how -chow derivative uh with some wild crossover because of that buffer zone um 
basically there were you know the, we weren't always really really good at keeping all the other hops from sexing <laughs> up the howler child that we put here and eventually it turned into mount hood and mount hood is fantastic howler child derivative that has a lot of that nice lemony and almost earthy kind of components uh, but it usually comes in between five and six and a half uh, alpha acids whereas a classic german howler child will come in um, right around three three and a half yeah. And basically, without all the science stuff, it's pretty much Hallertau grown in the Pacific Northwest, taking on the characteristics of the local terroir here, and that's what makes it different. It's very much a Hallertau, but it's got just the slightest kiss of a little bit of citrus in there that is distinctively Pacific Northwest hops. Uh, I love it because of that but it is also a hop that is super versatile if you use it right you can make a great pale ale out of this but it, for my money it's a, a perfect pilsner hop i love using it in pilsners and that nice fine light spicy scents Pix mm -hmm. brothers hi from france i love your advice and videos thanks for uh teaching me so much oh Pix, but yeah, Pix Brothers, that. I mean, if you could, please send us some beer. I <laughs> absolutely love French beer, and it is not as widely known as it should be. Basically, if you ever, if you ever say hi from a different area, we're probably just going to ask you for beer. Yeah, oh, 100%. <laughs> I don't know if that theme has come across. Yeah, has come across. Hi from I just, Africa, African uh, beer? <laughs> oh, I, I would love African beer. Someone, uh, all right. Let's see if we can, okay, let's, uh, try, let's try this. Hi from Japan. What do you say? <laughs> send me beer. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, in all wrong. honesty, that would be wrong. I would be, send me some sake. Uh, 100% send me some uh, sake. And I don't even care what kind. Uh, probably the Nagori. I love unfiltered sake. That's my jam. Or some beautiful plum wine. Green plums, not the red ones. Uh, but mostly, I just, I just love French beer. It's so fine and easy, delicious. Ah, man. Okay, sorry. Tim's, Tim's Derailed. Bi Tim's biased. Sometimes, no. Sometimes, but times. beer of the guard is my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorites. It's <laughs> so delicious. Damon, All right, wanna, Damon, you want to hit anything on Mount Hood? Or you want to go into the east? Uh, no. Um, yeast? I haven't used Mount Hood before. I usually stick to the basic traditional noble hops I when I'm feel, using these. So, how it like you in the throat? Okay, well, just because like, oh, your favorite is not my favorite. Hot <laughs> Mount Hood. That, I use, I use Hallertau and Tetanang a lot, so yeah, those man. are my go-tos for any of these German-style beers that I make. Yeah, I mean, for classic German-style beers, that's what you want to go with. So Mount Hood yeah. is definitely more um, a way to use less hot matter is why I like to use sometimes not the classics, but um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, the classic Hallertau would be perfect in this beer, too. Looks like yeah. you guys are actually getting a beer from Pix Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and it's aging right now. Thank you. Ooh, nice. Like, oh, oh, oh yes, please. That sounds good. Please. <laughs> also, um, nice. Jimmy, uh, compared to the versatility and flavor of Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier is a different hop in that. I would say Mount Hood is uh, more versatile, but uh, at the same time, it's a little less pungent than Mount Rainier. So if you're going for a pungent hop beer. Uh, uh, Mount Hood also, fun fact, is what Y yeast is named after. Yeah, so, so there you fun, go. Fun on it. Let's go on to the yeast. The yeast right. that I chose is the strain from Widmer, and it is actually their American Hefeweizen, their American wheat strain. This is a crazy versatile strain that I think most people do not understand how good it is um, because this strain can be used for any IPAs. It can be used for any Kolsch's, cream ales, light beers, pseudo lagers. Uh, this strain is clean, and I mean clean as in it drops bright for being a Hefeweizen strain, which is ridiculous. Um, and it's the it's A1010, which is American wheat from Y yeast, uh, and it's the strain that's straight off of Widmer Brewing. So, yeah, it is. It's a uh, it is an amazingly versatile yeast for far more things than uh, people use it for. Um, they see wheat in the name on Y yeast, and they're like, oh, I can only use this for wheat beers. And I'm like, ah, do you know how clean this yeast is? I would probably actually use this over 1056 for a clean beer oh, for sure. almost every time. Yeah. This is a far more forgiving yeast. Uh, 1056 is the American Ale strain, US05, uh, WLP001, Chico, all that kind yeah. of good stuff. Um, the, the, in my opinion, a far better, more hearty, more forgiving, and a cleaner yeast on that. Um, anything that you want a clean beer on, bam. Right here, American wheat. You, that's something to get mm -hmm. after. Yeah. I've, I've used, I haven't used it in IPA before, so that sounds really intriguing to me. Um, I've sadly used it just as a, your 
it, it was designed for. So I've used it in my Hefeweizen, the Whitbeer, beer, um, and then just a traditional wheat. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll need to expand a little more as well. Yeah, you can use a little more. Uh, I the uh, the I think it was the the wheat beer that you used, the American wheat style beer mm -hmm. that you made. Um, wait, was that the same the same base you ended up doing with the uh, the grates or two, or was that different? No, that was completely different. Okay. That was with the uh, I made an IPA and then mixed in a grater with that. So that was separate. Okay, I, one of those two. I remember having the beer that you made at the 1010. I remember liking it, but I I don't remember the details. Nah, it, um, it was super good. Yeah, I don't remember. All right, let's get another beer. Let's go on. Oh, well, well, okay. Let's talk about this beer. Okay. Well, what's let's uh, move on a little bit. You were drinking a little bit too fast. We'll talk about this fast. one drinking for a second. Drinking too fast or talking too little? Nah, that's also. No, because Damon's beer would be gone first then. Uh, I'm also going to throw in there because Geast and the Beast and uh, 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 Heo are also strain, calling me way. out. I did say uh, Nagori and that was entirely the wrong thing. Uh, Nagrini? I don't know. Perfect Snow is my favorite type of sake. Look it up. I'm not exactly <laughs> what type that sure what type that is. Uh, it is white and creamy and delicious and it needs and you know somebody needs to send me some perfect snow he's got some he's got sushi on his mind so he's trying yeah. to say nigiri that i was thinking the genie um kevin rabe is k97 the, the same strain as a1010 um k97 K is not k97 is a german ale strain um whereas uh, uh 1010 is the widmer strain it's a uh, a different unique beast that has been crafted at widmer brewing for the longest time well we got a hi from switzerland yeah nice what do we say send us some chocolate and beer. Oh. <laughs> that was and be send us some chocolate beer. <laughs> some chocolate. Hey, <laughs> yeah. there you go. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, everybody always says Swiss chocolate is great, so I'm going to yeah. assume it is. But if you have a better local treat, also send it with the beer. Like, send us a snack and beer. How about that? Street waffles? Oh, man. Yeah. I don't know Let's go on to our yeah. topic number one. If yeah. you guys got questions on the Roush beer or any of our takes on the Roush beer, I know it took a really roundabout uh, way of kind of explaining our favorite malt tops and yeast <laughs> this time with those. Probably a little more focused next time, guys. Whatever. We were <laughs> perfectly focused. This is a delicious beer from uh, Odd Ooh. 13. It is great. Speaking of focus. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, speaking of focus, we were going to talk about before we point. popped another beer. Um, table. Awesome beer. Keep it up, guys. Send us uh, Odd 13 if you're listening. Send us some more beer because this was this was delicious. It was delicious, yeah. Um, the well, it's, it's a hazy IPA, I'm guessing? Yeah. It is a hazy IPA quadruple dry hopped. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a big, big hot pungent. Uh, the aroma comes out. You've got huge, I would say, like lemon and pine and just a subtle amount of like mango, not a ton of tropical fruit. So it's a little bit mm -hmm. different than your standard um, your standard big juice bombs when it comes to hazy IPAs. But uh, really, I'm going to really say good. that's probably the Simcoe and uh, Equinod in there, and okay. I really mm -hmm. love to see that. It's giving it more bitterness, which is phenomenal <clears throat> for my taste. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, add uh, ascorbix. You spelled it wrong. It's ascorbix acid. Yeah. Um, A-S-S -S space K-O-R-B-I-C-Z. Yeah. Ascorbix. Uh, add it to the mash, just like Funky Brewer said. Yep. Also, yeast in the beast, if Koreans make the... Uh, best uh unfiltered uh sake send some to us prove it i'm calling you out right now prove it send some all right let's Gina, pick Gina's live stream is basically us asking for alcohol <laughs> like all the time oh that was convenient <laughs> <laughs> jim, well, jim right. randomly drew beers he has he didn't know what he grabbed so i got two odd uh, 13 beers <laughs> uh we're drinking uber noob hazy double uh ipa mosaic el dorado Turo, vienna rye that's a little bit different for a hazy i like that fun let's do it no, all right <laughs> let's go on to topic number one while he's opening up that uh and that's uh it's mistakes people make when starting breweries and so it's basically <laughs> uh when you're jumping into a brewery there's a lot of things uh, especially as a lot of you out there are home brewers thinking about getting into the brewing world uh or you know new brewers people that are new to the brewing world um or that are trying to get into. I know we have a number of people that actually brew uh, in some capacity on commercial scales. Um, so I want to talk about some, some ways to not suck at that, basically. Uh, and part of this is because Damon is, has been a operating brewer for two years. But he's just Literally now getting in three. three years, but just now getting into opening up his tap room in the next two months. And so he's got a, you know, a little bit of a growth coming <laughs> up. Um, and so it seems like a good time to talk about things that are, that are going to happen when you get into uh, opening a tap room and, you know, scaling up your brew to a bigger system. 
Yeah. Um, this is, a, as Peter was saying, this is something especially homebrewers make a lot of mistakes in because you've been brewing for a long time and you understand processes. It's great. That's awesome. That is knowledge that you should have before uh, opening a brewery. But there's a lot of things homebrewers don't take into account. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk. Let's start with one that I think you already have figured out a little bit, uh, and that is uh, when you start a brewery. One mistake that a lot of people I see make is assuming that you will be the brewer. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you've already kind of seen that one unfold a little bit. Just, yeah. just a little. This is something unless you have partners going into it, yeah. like you will probably not be the brewer in this you can come up with all the recipes and tell your brewer what to make and all that kind of good stuff but if you are a single person uh, if you are a, a single individual going into starting a brewery you, you probably shouldn't be the brewer you should be focusing on the business and making the business succeed and having somebody else to actually has the time to make the beers for you yeah what yeah. have you seen, Damon? I'm I'm by myself, um, and yeah, I, I'm already looking for <laughs> a head brewer. There's so much that goes into the business side of whether it comes to from marketing to dealing with employees, taxes, mm. filing monthly reports, quarterly reports, annual reports. There's a lot that goes into that uh, distribution, um, and so and as you guys know from home brewing, brewing takes a lot of work. Um, it's not just a, you know, set up and brew. You the maintaining the process of the fermentation, cleaning takes half the time, if not longer. Yeah, sometimes, half the time, no. <laughs> if you <laughs> want to be a brewer, expect <laughs> to be a good cleaner. Yeah. That is what you are going to do the most. Uh, washing kegs actually is probably what you're going to do the most. Yeah. Of. No, most because uh, obviously I I went around and talked to a lot of different breweries and most assistant brewers, 95 percent of an assistant brewer is cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, but, that's what an assistant brewer's job is yeah. for is literally to clean because the brewer doesn't have time to do it uh, or doesn't want to. Spe but speaking of, we are now seeking an assistant brewer. So if any of you guys are interested, please apply. <laughs> that's not exactly a joke. Uh, no. I mean, you know, do we will maybe hire you. Uh, <laughs> If you're but, really good at cleaning. <laughs> but that, that literally is something that yeah. uh, you have to do. That takes so much time. So either you are going to hire somebody else to take care of your finances and to run your business and everything like that, or you're going to take care or hire somebody to take care of your beer. And usually what you want the control over, you want control over both. Ideally, uh, you want somebody you trust to be making your beer, but usually when it comes down to it, your priority is going to be making those business decisions and being the one that's running the business. So... Part of those yeah. decisions though are is kind of what what kind of beer that you're making. Yeah, um, yeah. Like for me, it's going to be I'm, I am actually focusing on German style uh, beers for a lot of my stuff, and so even if I'm not brewing, you know, I'm going to have some input and direction to what beer is being made when and what's up next, what we're running out of, how to change it. But there's still some autonomy for that head brewer to make their own decisions. Yeah, and yeah. It, but I mean, it'd be hard if you had to actually be the one that was in there doing yeah. <laughs> all that at the same, like doing the brewing and trying to create the scheduling for that. And there's on, it, on top of just being a lot of actual labor, it's a lot to think about, it's a lot of work. It um, is. Just, just kind of, you know, wrapping your head around that while wrapping your head around, I gotta pay these taxes, while wrapping your head around, I need to get the, mm -hmm. you know, this out into market. Um, there's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of hats. Yeah, I think the it's, biggest thing is just like managing quality. Mm -hmm. um, if you put, all your effort into one thing, you're probably going to do a pretty good job at it. So when you have to break that up to 20 different things that comes with running a business, um, something's going to suffer. And yeah. so having a partner or a head brewer or somebody to do different aspects um, is going to be huge. Having a good team is, I think, what it's all about. Yeah. Um, we're yeah. going to go into scaling towards the end of this because it's going to lead into uh, topic number two. Um, but scaling is the actually the first thing that I wrote down. A lot of people don't understand how scaling works <laughs> going from a homebrew scale or even a one barrel scale to a bigger scale. Um, but we'll hit that at the end. Uh, Thing number two that I think makes people uh, people kind of have a hiccup on when starting a new brewery is not understanding or reacting to the market in any way. Uh, I'm going to add on to this is being stubborn about the beers that you want to make and not the beers that should be out on the market. Mm -hmm. I think there was a comment earlier mm -hmm. in this about a guy going to a new brewery. We have one like this down the uh, road and everything in there was about 10% because that's what he likes. Uh, and 
uh, that's a hard brewery to taste down. Uh, the one that we have, uh, I enjoy his beers yeah. a whole mm-hmm. hell of a lot. It's, yeah, it's a great brewery. Yeah, great and beer. I really normally good. have one beer and switch over to ciders because they're a little bit lighter and I can afford to drink. Uh, not afford, but I, <laughs> I can drink more and still remain soberish, yeah. um, <laughs> which is 100% fine. If you are in a, a, a saturated market, I shouldn't say saturated, if you are in a market that allows you to be able to do that, especially around other places, I think that's an awesome thing because you can go and you can taste other things as well. But at the same time, if you can't keep people in or make beers that they want to drink and stay there and actually buy them, you're not going to succeed as business. You may love these beers, but if people aren't buying them, it's a whole bunch of wasted money. To kind of lead into Damon's concept, uh, I think a good uh, a good example of what's done right in Spokane. Uh, the the per- per- person that I actually probably respect as the best brewer in Spokane is uh, the head brewer Whistlepunk, and he loves German style beers. He does oh, lagers yeah. like nobody's business, like the best oh, German style lagers in Spokane. But he's got half of his board is filled with all the stuff that he wants, and half of his board is filled up with what he knows will sell. Mm-hmm. That's uh, we have a tank here at Genus that is specifically devoted to IPAs. And I can tell Which you, is our least favorite thing to brew. Like, <laughs> uh, well, it, discovering new techniques to get more out of hops as well as using new hops yeah. uh, is fun to experiment around with that. But in all honesty, I mean, it, it's kind of, once you start nailing down your process, it's kind of a boring beer to brew because it's the same thing over and over and over. And you yep. know, it, if I had a choice, we would probably brew far fewer IPAs, but our IPAs are so gosh darn delicious. <laughs> they allow us to brew something like squid Why are beer. we so good at this? Damn it. <laughs> right? Darn we it. can't sell squid beer if we didn't have our IPAs. <laughs> um, and I think Peter and I have both experienced this, that there is beers on squid tap beer coming soon. right now mm-hmm. that uh, we would dump down the drain, willingly dump down the drain, but they made their way on the tap and people are loving them. So you know what? We're selling it because people love it, whether we like it or not. Yeah, I know a couple of breweries that the the head brewer and a lot of the staff don't really like certain types of their own beers, but they're like their top sellers. And so yeah. they have to continue making them. And yeah, I mean, I'm going to go with the same concept. Obviously, I'm hoping people like the German beers I make, but obviously I'm going to continue to, you know, half will be German, half will be the more standard stuff like some IPAs. I got to have those on tap for what people want. And so yeah. I think finding that right compromise of what you want to do and hopefully it works um, that, that the place that's here that has the stronger beers, they do a really good job. Um, yeah. Place is usually pretty busy. And mm-hmm. um, w- another point coming up later is creating an experience and style. And I think he's done that around those type of yeah. um, beer styles with what his tap room looks like. I would say uh, thematically, one thing that you might have an advantage on leading into is the new uh, cold IPA style. Mm-hmm. If you're already going with that German style and you've got to like kind of like lager-esque things on, um, that cold IPA style could be something that you kind of launch in Spokane that no one's mm-hmm. really done here. Mm-hmm. Somebody, go, go well, I was going to say, going into this too, this doesn't mean that you need to make bad beer just <laughs> because it sells. Just because people love to spend money on a light American lager doesn't mean, mean you need to make a Coors Light. You can make the best light American lager out there and actually have it be a fine, delicious, cool beer to make. And that can be your moneymaker on that. And through that, uh, you can actually change people's perspectives into demanding more out of their beer. They're used to drinking your light American lager that actually has flavor when they go to a bar and get a Coors Light or a Bud Light or any of the you know, big domestics. They're going to be left wanting and wanting more and then wanting your beer. So you don't, uh, especially as a brewery, you don't have to take this at, with a grain of salt being like, oh gosh, I have to make this beer again. Take it as a challenge and like, I don't like to make this beer. I don't like this style. How can I make it awesome? So everybody loves it and it's the best beer we can put on. I think you can, there's some comments about scaling. And so the size of the brewery also makes a huge impact. We're getting into scaling a little bit later. Uh, yeah, not actually scale, scale, not scaling recipes. Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a whole other, we'll get into that. But more so, the size of your brewery, whether you have a 20, 40 barrel system compared to, you know, a one, three, or seven, 
is going to be drastically different on what you make and, and how much you make and stuff. But yeah. real yeah. quick, somebody made a comment about um, starting a, or something about a brewery without a tap room. That's oh, what yeah. I've done for the last three years, and it's <laughs> it's a challenge. And when you have something like COVID come up, which hopefully it never does again, but uh, restaurants shut down. In ha basically, having a brewery without a tap room means your distribution only. Yeah. And so, and whether or not you're small or large, whatever you have, you're either distributing yourself or going through a distributor. And so, when you're reliant on businesses being open, it's very difficult. And one of the mistakes I made was starting too small with that. Um, my whole idea was that I wanted to just start small and see if I could even make good beer <laughs> before I went full blown into it. Um, kept a day job as well. And so um, it was really hard making, you know, two kegs at once and then trying to sell those and then trying to keep up with orders on that aspect. Um, I, you know, bring out samples of five places they'd all, one would say yes, and so then I only have one keg left, and then I get three calls in the same day for one keg that I have left, and I had to tell people no. That just builds a bad reputation for your brewery of that you don't have inventory or stock like that. So that was a huge challenge, and so if you don't have a tap room, it's gonna be a challenge. Also, if you're talking business-wise, the profit that you make selling a keg versus in-house beers is drastically different. Uh, yeah. Uh, on this, uh, we kind of got off a little bit on a tangent on what <laughs> brewers like versus that into the re not reacting in the market. And I, uh, I think we can roll not reacting into the market and not experimenting enough kind of into one in that you also hear brewers complaining about new trendy beers, hazy IPAs. Oh, my gosh. Like, you know, I'm one of them. I'll complain about hazy IPAs, too. <laughs> but this is something that if you make IPAs at your brewery uh, or if you're starting one out, you should probably expect to make trendy beers. You don't have to make them all the time, but you need to at least like make one or two and prove to yourself that you can, uh, you, that you can make these beers, that you can experiment around with beers. But if every customer is asking you for a style, there's a reason for it, and you should be reacting to your personal market like that. Uh, you know, if everybody wants a hazy IPA, you don't, I don't know, I, I don't want to say compromise yourself, give up your integrity, but find a way that it's going to be good for you to actually make this and give your mm -hmm. customers what they want. If one out of every five persons asking for a style of beer, you don't want to turn away their group or their per that person because you don't have that style of beer on. So I try to get it on and then make everything else whatever the, whatever you want. We make mm -hmm. some really weird stuff. And mm -hmm. sometimes we make weird stuff that goes faster than any IPA we put on tap. And sometimes we make weird stuff that's on for a month, which by the way, for us, a month is a long time. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> it, it is, it's incredible. I mean, the speed at which people drink our like super funky Brett pale ale Brett IPA is astounding. It's one of those things that you drink and you're like, this is a really good version of Brett. Huh? This is going to be here forever. And then you come back three days later and the thing is entirely gone. Um, it's awesome, you know, but be brave, experiment around with that. And you, you know, you'll have some great success in it. And like I keep saying, find a way to make it fun. Um, Find a way to challenge yourself in this. And this goes into not experimenting enough. <laughs> if you are doing the same thing. Which is one thing, of other points. Yeah. My OCD just needs to have that. Like yeah. clear, He's clearly got another point in, in that is not experimenting <laughs> enough. And I, I will fully believe <laughs> this. We brushed over it and be like, I feel like we never <laughs> yeah. actually talked about it. No. <laughs> uh, I fully believe you need to experiment around with things. It's good to have flagships. It's good to have your consistent things. But experimentation is awesome uh, it, it, it helps you become a better brewer it helps you become a better brewery because you'll start to see trends in beer you'll start to see what your clientele is really starting to love in odd styles and what you can actually start to push in that as well um, and I'm also a firm believer if you were doing the same thing every time if you were standing still you're being left behind you don't have to be moving backwards to be left behind everybody else is moving forward and you're standing right here you're not keeping up with the game and that is very dangerous I know a number of people who started out with the idea that they're gonna have their flagship amber porter IPA mm -hmm. light beer and that was kind of they wanted that to be their tap list that's how they wanted to start out um, I think that mentality has been gone for 
or should have been gone like five plus years ago. Now that mm -hmm. there's so many breweries out there, so many, so much resources for getting all those styles done right. The only way to really stand out is to just make whatever you want to make, but make it really good and unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, if I would open my tap room three years ago when I first started, if I would have gone straight to the tap room, I 100% would have fallen into that. Yeah. And I would have had four flagships that were an IPA, a porter, an amber, <laughs> and like a lager. And so I'm, yeah. I'm glad that I've learned a lot more and, and waited to develop it and, and figured out how to make a niche. There's nothing wrong with having these flagships, you know. No. Uh, not at all. There's nothing wrong with having beers, reliable beers on all the time that people can come back to. But experimentation it will keep you alive. It will keep you sane in there. It will keep people coming back, too. Even though you know that your regular, uh, you know, let's call him Jerry, is going to drink <laughs> six reds when he's here. He's also going to come in and try that new, you know, uh, terpene infused IPA or the new cereal infused brown as well. And it keeps them interested. It keeps them coming back. Oh, I got to go try this now. Even though they're moving back to their set standards, that experimentation is awesome. I mean, it, it's a, for us anyway, it's a lifeblood of our brewery. It's something that we've uh, actually developed as a culture here. People don't expect the same beer. They get kind of uh, a little bit upset sometimes when they see the same beer on tap, yeah. always. We've, learned, we've, we've taught them how to expect the unexpected. Yeah, uh, which is uh, pretty darn awesome. Um, the apartment brewer has a great question. If market slash demand slash cost wasn't a factor, what would you want to brew all the time? And I can say for oh, myself man. that I'd personally be a 100% sours and lagers. Uh, yes, uh, I will throw some modified things in there. I would probably always 100% of the time have a beer to guard on as well <laughs> as a true and probably cast conditioned ESB on. Uh, I love those two beers, but lagers and sours, stupidly awesome. And I mean, simple ones, Dortmunder. I would mm. always have a Dortmunder. I would you, always have a You can get off on those for, like, for the rest of like, I mean, the, the depth of how far you can go with those. I would never get bored is I think, I think that the gist of that. Oh, yeah. The quick way to say it is I could do sours and lagers for forever and not get bored and always have fun and always like what I'm drinking. Yeah, I mean, lagers is a big realm. Jump Jasper, thank you so much for the super chat. Yay! Appreciate that. Mm. For uh, me, it would all be German style. Anything, like, mainly the... the uh, the loggers, I mean, they take a lot of time to make when that loggering right. process. And so if marketing cost wasn't a deal, yeah, 100% all German styles, which also I think leads into another question. We get caught up here a little bit. Um, what beer was your next obsession after losing your init initial interest in IPAs, assuming you started with an IPA? I started with... That's a pretty good question. Sadly, yeah. B Bud Light. Hmm. But hmm. then my first craft beer... Um, I'm from Seattle. My first craft beer was Mac and Jack's. That was like the go-to. Like, this is such a good beer. It's amazing. That was and everybody in our age. Yeah, this is like okay, not good. surprising. Okay, good. Well, yeah. and then Manny's. Manny's and Mac and Jack's were uh, kind of like hand in hand. Yeah. And then, yeah, easily for me, I fell into I switched over to IPAs. Yep. I think the Sierra Nevada Torpedo IPA was like one it's of my first go-tos. Um, and then now, I mean, if you haven't figured it out already, my obsession is German beers. <laughs> Uh, whether the smoked ones from the Roush or Lichtenhainers or Dortmunder, Doppelbox. I mean, that's yeah. my new obsession. Yeah, I like it. There's uh, a there's a, a fun meme out there that is the, the evolution of a craft beer drinker. And I think it's it's funny because it's super <laughs> accurate. And it goes light lagers, that yeah. Bud Light, yeah. Bud Light, Bud Light, uh, uh, light lagers, IPAs, uh, Imperial Stouts, so like all that super barrel-aged stuff, mm -hmm. sours, light lagers <laughs> so I, the evolution everyone kind of finishes back on light lagers <laughs> and i think that's super accurate because when you've had so like all the big flavors we've tasted all the big flavors i still love big flavors don't get me wrong mm -hmm. but, but i went from being able to drink a lot of those big flavored beers to now i just want something that i can crush and not have it weigh down my palate and so i'm back i'm like I, I now want that you know maybe it started out with that bud light bush light whatever and now that light lager is like i want a good pilsner i want a good german hellas i want like wow. all those mm -hmm. Classic I, light lagers, if, but yeah. still, they're the best representation of good brewers. 100%. I, I just actually did that this last weekend. Uh, we went to a place in Post Falls called the uh, Filling Station, 
Yeah, I'm thinking I'm going to have two beers. All right, let's make it worth it. Started out with a Cuvée de Jacobins, uh, absolutely amazing Flanders Red on that. Moved over into a sour stout that was super delicious. And then uh, we decided to stay. So I had like five E9 Kolsch, which was just stupid delicious. And in all honesty, if I'm having something to drink that's amazing, it's probably going to be something in that realm. Pilsner, a well-made Pilsner is my favorite beer in the world. Unless you have a really good Zweckel as well. And then, <laughs> oh man, that is going straight in my, fra my face hole. Stefan Stoudemire, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Would you be so kind as to advise how much pineapple juice or thawed pieces of uh, thawed pieces for a five gallon juicy? <laughs> this is a really unique question because pineapple also has enzymes, which are an active component in what pineapple does. And so if I were to take pineapple and freeze it myself, so this is fresh pineapple, assuming that it hasn't been processed, um, this is going to be a different equation if it's for frozen from the store pineapple, but fresh pineapple, I chop it up into cubes and then throw it into a freezer bag and put it in the freezer to break apart the cell walls and then throw that. I would put it into my mash because of how the enzymes are going to act. Uh, pineapple actually has protease in it. And so it's actually a really good, um, uh, a really good complement to a hazy or high adjunct beer, which is going to be a higher protein beer. Um, so that's where I'd throw most of my pineapple in. If I'm adding pineapple juice to the end of it, I would probably add about a quart, which is a liter-ish um, of pineapple juice into the final fermented beer um, right before going into keg. That's the two ways that I would add it. But I would, if I'm using pineapple, I'd probably take into account the fact that it can be really helpful in the mash and use that as well. Um, all right. So with that, I'm going to move on to our next uh, bullet point because there's a great question that rolls right into it. Create an experience and style. Uh, breweries uh, and even breweries across the street from each other tend to develop unique personalities. That's a combination of the brewery and the clientele of itself. You cannot force your own personality into a brewery without taking into uh, account the clientele as well. But uh, it, you need to create something, a reason why people being there, a reason why people are feeling at home. Uh, and the question for this, um, Ledger Hill 89, uh, is there a reason that Genus chooses to keep mm -hmm. a big set of recipes public on Brewer's Friend versus holding your cards close? Uh, one of the basic philosophies for Genus here is we want every single person out there to be drinking and making better beer. Uh, I've always said this, if somebody- then if, we're the best, we're the best of the best. That's right. But <laughs> if everybody's making, so if uh, somebody like Stone Brewing Company comes to us and, comes to us and says, hey, I want your recipe. And Peter's got some bad gas. Uh, I want your recipe, because this is an awesome recipe. We're gonna say, hell yeah, here it is, make and this. send us a case. Uh, also that, uh, send us some beer. Uh, the reason uh, for that being, uh, I, somebody wants to send us beer from South Africa. Oh yes, please. They, they, want, they, they ask, what are the laws? How do they send? Oh, um, a lot of the time, actually, if uh, you send it through uh, UPS or FedEx or one of the big national carriers, um, they will work everything into it. So you just give them the box and mm -hmm. pay the fees, and it comes. Uh, but the reason why we give our recipes away, and it's even to other breweries or breweries that are technically competing with us, is because if we do, that means they're going to make better beer. And if they're making better beer, we have to make better beer. And the customer is drinking better beer. Mm -hmm. They expect better beer. And that way, we're all getting a better beer experience all around. Uh, it's a basic philosophy of let's eliminate bad beer. Basically, if there's no bad beer, it's all delicious beer. And we all have a great experience. We're all being challenged to make better beer. So. That one's for you, Tim. What? The super chat. Somebody Adam Chumley, thank you so much. No, yeah, I brought up in Beth, like literally just a few seconds ago. That's not a, that's not a good rant for me right now. I'll try Run and think of one before we're Jimmer done. Peeps. But yeah, so I mean, it's it's one of those things. Uh, we're creating that experience here of a complete beer experience. Yep. You're coming here, you're gonna learn about beer, you're gonna enjoy delicious beer, you can take home and make delicious beer. That's what we're thriving for. Uh, and it, 
it creates a uniqueness to us. It's also really important to mention that uh, we do have a philosophy that your system and your style of brewing is going to have a bigger impact on your beer than, uh, than the ingredient recipes alone. Uh, by the way, that brings me to somebody who had a comment up top about- I'm gonna interrupt that, Daniel. Yes, that, that is a, a perfect hard flex. Take our beer, you can't make it as good as us anyway. That's what uh, we go for, yeah. Well, you can't make it the same as us, I'll say that. Yeah. Damon can make it almost as good as us, but he's yeah. probably the second best. That's um, also because we make this beer Someone was mentioning uh, uh, doing the, their favorite beer. It was on the question of if you had to make one style, uh, what would you make? And they were like, uh, all English style pub beer, ESBs, mm. whatever. Oh, and yeah. uh, mm. he's going to have a ton of Maris Otter and Golden Promise on hand. I think that was the apartment brewer, but I'm not sure. If it wasn't, then I'm going to add to that <laughs> that uh, you forgot Halcyon. You forgot Halcyon. And you need to include Halcyon. You also forgot Chevalier. And as a, if you're doing English styles, you probably need both of those malts in your repertoire. Yeah, Chevalier is big boy, Halcyon is little boy. Mm. You want big boy, you go <coughs> Chevalier. You want little boy, you go That's Halcyon. actually a good description of that. It's uh, Halcyon, Maris Otter, Golden Promise, Chevalier. Yeah. Uh, well, Spring and Pearl are probably right above Pearl's a little Halcyon. Above, yeah, Pearl's a little above, I don't know what Spring is. Anyways, going on to what, are we, what are we talking about, guys? Uh, so we're creating talking about experience. creating experience and style. <laughs> creating experience and style on there is what we were just on. You know, just uh, create something really unique. You can't, uh, don't expect to throw a bunch of crap into your brewery, have it look cool, and then expect people to like you because of that. Let's mm -hmm. go into, let's go uh, to Damon. And, like, what are you, because you're trying to create, a, I think, a pretty unique experience with your, mm -hmm. uh, with your tap room that you're doing. You're in the process of kind of making that happen right now. So what are, what are you going for? Um, I want total, total theme first and then vibe check. What's that vibe check going to look like? Why do you want people to feel a way? Yeah. Uh, total theme. I'm not trying to do anything like extravagant and like just a decked out type of theme. But uh, at the same time, uh, my logo has a bear on it and we're in the Pacific Northwest and I'm making German beers. And so um, <laughs> kind of all of that mixed together going with, you know, like a woodsy Pacific Northwest type of vibe. Uh, something very lumber uh, sexual. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, no, uh, so I'm very chill. Um, I want an environment where people can just come in and don't feel overwhelmed by the environment. Um, they feel more relaxed um, and that they can have a good beer and have a good chat with a friend. Um, I it always hurts me whenever I go out to some type of restaurant and I see, you know, a family of whatever a group of friends that are out together at a big table and half of them are on their cell phone just scrolling through stuff. And so um, I want some type of environment that feels warm and inviting to where people can just have conversations. A Faraday cage is what you're looking for. It blocks all <laughs> signals coming in, so you have no reception. You're forced to talk to people. That could be an interesting concept, actually, to have like specific uh, like personal booths that you could go into that's an actual Faraday cage and be like, this is a cell phone free zone. You won't even get a call from 911. <laughs> Why would 911 call you? Uh, magic. 911's <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden like, oh, we need some help, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, fine. You won't get it. <laughs> Dang it. Uh, uh, I just I'm got my first house here because of the stream. What do I use it for? First, yeah. Juicy IPA. Juicy yep. IPA. I think somebody said Juicy Doppelbach. Oh, stuff. yeah. That could be actually <laughs> I, really interesting. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm going to take a second. Uh, somebody did comment that the color of this beer was a little bit different. The Vienna and the rye are adding mm. to that. And I think that this beer added it wonderfully. Uh, Vienna uh, would be really dangerous and a juicy IPA to me because it can get super sweet, especially with the background of uh, the hazy. This is done well. You get that touch of fruitiness in there. That's awesome. Thank you, Odd13 and Tabber. The apartment brewer may have missed it earlier. What's the name of the tap room going to be? It is uh, No Drought, right? Yeah. Just no, yeah. No, no Drought. drought. No Drought Brewing Company. Uh, no drought I will Co. be linking the social medias no. below. Uh, you probably already have seen it in some Genus Not Brewing videos. I probably linked it below in some of those. So it's available. But yeah. going off of kind of the vibe or the aesthetics appeal, um, German style, best malls uh, for the malls. No. So I reached out to them, uh, been in chats with them about few things and uh, they have a, a shop or whatever you can buy stuff for and so they have a really cool like malt display case mm. that I thought would be really cool to hang up in there um, and then like a poster of like the entire brewing process as well from malts to the brewing and finishing so yeah but just keeping it simple 
Yeah. Best malts, my favorite German maltster. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Wireman. Wireman, you're cool, but you're Sorry. just too... Just, uh, you know, best, <laughs> best malts is just so classically... Yeah. German for their malts. If well, you're going, they're smaller than Weirman too. Like Weirman's a huge company. Best yeah. Malts is not nearly as big as Weirman, and I think because of that, even though they're clean Pilsner, and of course they're Heidelberg, which is the best Pilsner malt you can possibly use ever. Use it. Um, uh, even though those are really really good base malts, they do some really fun stuff. Like when they launch their Red X and Special X. Oh yeah. Which obviously we talk about a ton. Mm-hmm. Um, everything they do is just they they do really good stuff, and they're still they're small enough that they can experiment and play around with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Somebody asked where I'm opening. Uh, it's going to be in, in the valley, actually not too far from Genus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scooting distance. Yeah. Scooting distance. We're going to have a, a scooter trail uh, yeah. scooter from a, a couple of valley breweries. We're going to call it the trail trail. The trail trail. Yeah. Of Scooty trails. scoot trail of beers. The trail of trails. Yeah. Trails. If you've got better names, which I doubt because those are pretty good, it's pretty um, good. let us know. Mm-hmm. Come up with some good names for uh, what you want the trail trail to be. All right. Uh, <laughs> before uh, homebrew, we do. Yeah, we're drinking a homebrew IPA. No idea who it's from, but we're gonna drink it. It looks <laughs> clear, not oxidized, so that's great. Looks like an awesome West Coast IPA. It's got a little bit of oranginess, which, which I'm guessing is from Munich malts or some Ooh. sort of Munich derivative. I hope so. I am. Yeah, hoping it's not, not from crystal, crystal. malt because you guys know my. Never use it. Oh. Okay. Uh, Reverend, no, we have not used anything from Skagit Valley yet. Uh, send us a couple of bags of stuff, and we will use it and let you know what we think. Um, so I thought of kind of a cool idea. Um, since you, It's funny because that whole, why do you post on Brewers Ran? Yeah. I think it was like one of the first questions I asked you when I first met you. <laughs> <laughs> and walked into a new home. Um, but somebody had an idea mm. to... Uh, have like a challenge, like a homebrew challenge where, hey, here's our recipe. One recipe. Go ahead and make you. it and see what it turns out to be. That means if we use your recipe, you have to come here with your ver- brewed version of it yeah. and so we can taste it side by side, plus local beer from your town. Uh, first thing I'm going to say about this, it's definitely homebrewed. There is some hose water going on in there, which is probably chlorine from their water. Yep. Chlorophenol. Right. It's, it's got a little bit of chlorophenol in there. The clarity on it's really nice. There's a lot of good flavors. You can tell it's a well-made beer, uh, mm-hmm. but there is a chlorophenol in that, which makes it, it, it tastes like uh, like medicinal Band-Aid or, uh, or hose water is a good way to put it. If you poured the beer <laughs> through uh, a like hose and you kind of get that rubbery taste, that's yeah. kind of what it's in there. Other words, this is pretty, I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. it's a pretty well-made beer. Um, it's very No clear. oxidation on yeah. it. Well, I got very, the yeast. Uh, so. You got it. Yeah, I, could, gotcha. yeah, I could tell it's a well-made beer. It's just one mm-hmm. thing. Um, but going back to um, yeah. mistakes people make starting a brewery. Um, yeah, the topic that we're talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, good, understanding. Uh, okay. Hey. No, I meant I had a comment about okay. that. Okay, yeah. Go, got the do host, it. Host water deal. I made that mistake. Um, cause I started as like a side, like a hobby thing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I should have gotten more involved and, and dedicated, but it was more, you know, I kept my day job and wanted to see what I can make of this. And so I didn't understand water chemistry and how vitally important it is. And so the second batch I made had a different water I used in the first batch and oh, yeah. it turned out you just that terrible. Steady flow yeah. That was, yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. We made fun of you a little bit. Yeah. I had no idea why. Yeah. Second yeah. batch I ever made. But yeah, that's but you learn from of, that. Yeah, that's exactly. the important thing. You knew uh, well. You brought it to people who knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. We identified the problem for you, and you didn't and make that mistake filter. again. And that's that's an important <laughs> thing, uh, actually, in starting your own brewery is objectively judging your own beers. Uh, you can't just say, "Well, I know there's a flaw in this, but I love it because that's what I love." If you know there's a flaw, you need to fix that flaw. That can't, don't be Heineken and put the flavor of skunk butthole into your beer because people think they like it. Um, there's your rant. Uh, Carter West, I'm making a raspberry sour. What's a good ratio of frozen raspberries for a five gallon batch? Three to five pounds for a five gallon batch. Um, frozen raspberries, and I also will add that you should pasteurize them, i.e. bring them up to near boiling before adding them into your fermenter. Yeah. Uh, I promise you that'll help. Um, soak in all the juicy raspberry flavors and not let those ferment back out. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's, next, go, let's move on next to... Next bullet. Somebody yeah. made a comment about this earlier, too. Yeah. Uh, yes. That already talking about this. The, uh, I wanted to hit on, that the time too. on the yeah. Yeah. That was Reverend. Uh, Reverend KY oh. made a uh, comment about this. Understanding the value of time in the fermenter, and this is a huge thing in huge. breweries. Huge. Uh, and that's actually why big breweries have specific equipment, like conical fermenters, is 
time is money in fermenters. Most yep. big breweries, most professional breweries cannot afford to waste time in a fermenter with their beer. That equals money you could be selling on tap. So mm -hmm. that, that's something you have to fully understand. If you're making beer at home that you're used to spending three to four weeks on, you need to find a way to shorten that down to maybe 10 to 14 days. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to, so, so when you are making beer, you have to select around what styles of beers you're making. And that does, that does mean that if you are limited in terms of what styles uh, you, uh, or what amount of fermenters you have, that limits you in terms of what styles you can always be making. Because if you are spending, um, let's say six weeks to ferment out of beer, like you do a lot of times on the homebrew scale, but you only have three unit tanks or you only have three <laughs> fermenters and three bright, bright tanks, you're going to be very, very limited in what you can actually put on tap. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, that limits what you can do as a brewery, what you can sell to your public, what you can actually make in there. There's a reason we have a dedicated IPA tank, uh, not just because we sell a lot of IPAs, but for the speed at which we need to move everything through there. Um, it's one of the reasons that for us, we've, uh, in certain beers, we've actually moved into Quike. Uh, <laughs> Quike is a super fast fermenter. Most of the time when I'm looking to make a clean beer, I'm using Lutra. And I can make a lager, a pseudo lager, in about six, seven days, chuck it into uh, some kegs, and then let it lager in the cooler. And now I can make another beer and have it on tap while that lager is aging out and becoming nice and crispy um, that's something and it goes into brewery planning as well uh, we do brew a lot on a whim here but it's also a kind of planned whim uh, we don't know exactly the style we're making but we do know the type of beers that we need we need you know a dark malty beer or we need a light hoppy beer at this time so this space rolls up and we fill it with that whatever we make in that realm that's something you really have to be aware of and planning out your fermenters to not sit empty empty fermenters are costing you money every single day and that's something as a professional mm -hmm. brewer you really have to take into account uh, both damon and i are in a spot right now where we kind of have a, a monetary limit on our, our fermenter space that we have and so it, it has a lot of cost efficacy to make sure that we're planning that out so that we can turn mm -hmm. beers around faster you want to mm -hmm. talk about what, what we got going on yeah uh, downtown yeah yeah uh, steel barrel tap room a uh, little incubator space and so um yeah i got we have one fermenter and one bright tank dedicated to each brewery <coughs> and so <laughs> if you if it's empty like you're you're just literally losing money um and so trying to plan out and figure out when to brew, who's going to brew. This goes back to you're probably not going to be the head brewer um, because <laughs> of how how quickly that needs to happen. Like, ideally, you are you never have an empty fermenter. So as soon as you transfer out of a, a fermenter into a bright tank, uh, you already have a batch that is brewing right then. So you can clean that fermenter and then instantly fill it back up with, with your next batch. Yeah. Uh, and one of the ways to do that, um, is to use something like Quike so you can turn around a beer in four or five days if you need to, uh, and then you can get that beer cleaned and you can even get it crashed in the same fermenter uh, and ready to transfer, get it brighted in a short amount of time and get it kegged so that you can have another beer going back on top of it. But another big part about that with our space is it's really hard to do, let's say, high alcohol beers. Um, it's really hard to do, like we can't do, uh, we used to do a lot of barley wines, we did our Count Chocula on that, mm -hmm. um, but those are beers that are hard to... Uh, plan for because you know that we're spending that amount of money if we have it sitting in the fermenter for you know a month and a half or even like a lager i mean if you're going to lager it in the bright and or you I mean you can put it into kegs and then try yeah. to lager through there but that's going to sit you're going to get one brew for in a, an entire month if not l like longer so yeah. that's it's 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 a tough thing to deal with yeah so value of time uh, planning a lot of your brews around uh you know around the time that you have to spend on them um, it's really important. So Quike has been an amazing thing. I think a lot of breweries have kind of taken to using Quike just for that quick turnaround time. Uh, but yeah, it's been a pretty, uh, I think nationwide or not, if not worldwide, big uh, upset in, um, in how people are brewing. Uh, the last thing we have for topic one was um, how much time is spent on each task within owning a brewery. And I feel like that's not a, lot, a thing that a lot of people don't necessarily realize. Uh, is how much time is spent on 
you know, planning out your batches, how much time is spent. You've got to get beers into kegs. You got to get them distributed. You got to get them. Uh, you got to get your name out there. Um, you have to take care of your marketing, your planning. How much time is spent on each one thing is something that's really important to know and understand before you get into it because you've got to either plan on doing a lot of it yourself or hire the people slash work with the people who can kind of help you out on each task. Uh, apartment Brewer actually had a question kind of on this. Uh, since you can only do one, which is better, brewer, owner, or manager, um, huh. you know, it, don't let go of your company for somebody that you hired. I can say that. So you, if you aren't the <clears throat> manager of it, don't give them more power than you. Uh, don't let them run away with your place unless mm -hmm. you trust them. But this goes into do whatever you're strongest at uh, and hire somebody else in who is stronger in that other position than you know where your limits are in this you know it's one of those things uh, at genus here uh, i can do it 100 percent. i've done it before i'm not the best with accounting and books and paying <laughs> you know our taxes and things like that uh, so I don't do that here. What I am really good at is worrying about beer and processing and making sure that everything is going right, going into kegs right, that we have what we need to do these things. And so I take that role on and we have somebody else that we put into that other position. Uh, it's, uh, well, Peter does most of it. <laughs> well, that's not, not true. We actually we, hired somebody else in to do it. I'm the, but, I, I'm the best at delegating is what I'll say. Yeah. But. Uh, putting people into positions where they're going to perform the best and is where they, what you should I do. would also add where they feel uh, they feel empowered to use their own autonomy to create success. That is 100% true. Trust your team. Yeah. If you are constantly sitting on your phone watching the cameras to make sure that everything is going right and everybody's doing their job, you are either being way too controlling on that or you don't trust your team and you need to do something different. That ends up being a waste of your time too. Uh, yeah. It's a waste of everybody's time. It creates a hostile work environment. It's not good for everybody. You should, uh, in this whole thing, you know, how much time is spent on each task? Should This should be something that you're thinking about. If you are watching the cameras the whole time, how much money did you literally just <laughs> waste watching a camera? because you didn't trust somebody or because you just can't let go of this. Should you be doing that task instead so everybody can be using their time appropriately that makes sense and you're just not literally blowing through hundreds of dollars for no reason? Yeah, like, where do you see yourself? Well, I think this is 100% of a, a preference question. Um, if you want to start your own brewery and have the business of the brewery, I think 99 times out of 100, you should be taking the owner uh, business manager role rather than the head brewer. I think it's, I mean, un unless you just want to have a small, really small tap room, small brewery, and that's kind of your thing, then I think you can pull it off being the head brewer. Um, but there's, there's so much time that goes into both sides. And if you want to have more of an impact, I think, on what your brewery does and looks like, I think you should be on that owner side. But again, it's preference. Like if you just want to brew beer, then maybe you don't start your own brewery or you just start something really small. Um, but if you, you can just go work at another brewery and be try to become a, a head brewer somewhere and then you can just brew beer um, if that's what you prefer. Yeah, owning a brewery is uh, not being a brewer nine times out of 10. Yeah. Um, I would say that's probably the last thing that most people that own breweries end up doing. Um, I found out that very quickly because I would prefer to be brewing, but at the same time, I know that my time is better spent not doing that. If I could, you know, if I could retire and just be a brewer for a small, like, if hey, if you want to come drink it, you can, and I'm completely yeah. rich, have no idea about money, don't care about any of that, <laughs> and someone else is taking care of literally everything, my preferred position would be the brewer, but um, there, that's just, there's, there's not a lot of efficacy in that, and so it's, um, you, you got to have that... Uh, um, that that management where you are you're, you're doing mm -hmm. you're, you're bringing people around you that you trust to do what they do and you're empowering them to do basically your your job as the owner is to make sure that everybody around you has all the resources to succeed and yeah. that they want to succeed you should be supporting everybody and you know it how much is each task actually worth and that's actually worth and that's something I mean everything 
how much time and money <clears throat> does it take in relevance to everything else? And is this going to be something that's worth it for your brewery? The best you know. business owners in the brewery world, the best people that start business business in the brewery world are really good marketers, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Yes. If 100%. you're good at marketing, you're, yeah, you've got, uh, the rest of it's made, you know? <laughs> you can be a really shitty brewer. You can know zero about beer. If you're a good marketer, you're probably going to make more money than most people that are really good brewers that start breweries. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's... That's a sad truth. I don't want to yeah. say that out loud. I feel like I'm discouraging people, but... But I think, I mean, you guys have kind yeah. of a, a unique, unique thing where you guys are both owners. Yeah. And you're mainly focused on the brewing and you're focused on... The other business well, and getting partners so in there that yeah, partners yeah, is yeah, huge. Yeah, most huge. of what we're talking about right now is for more of a um single, single business person. owner yeah. in yeah. this like me yeah but that's another thing to go into it if you if you have three people guys who want to come together and make a brewery it shouldn't be three brewers <laughs> definitely not. uh it could be yeah. three brewers i mean that's kind of what we did here but, <laughs> but we one all of them's took really on, good at one thing and one of them's yeah, really, uh, yeah. That, yeah. Different but style. you should be taking on different aspects of the job you can't all three be back there brewing you can't yeah. all three be out front owning and guiding you should be putting people into where their strengths is to make everything the best that it possibly can be uh, you know, and realizing that I don't, you know, starting a brewery, I don't need to go to find four or five other brewers. I need to go find a really good, like maybe a CPA and I need mm -hmm. to go find a really good market manager and things like that. You know, Reverend made uh, come a brewing business by Sam. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Calgione. Isn't that the guy from Dr. Yeah. yeah. I've read that book. Great yeah. book. Highly recommend it. And, uh, you know, in all honesty, that's a guy who did this very, very successfully. He, <laughs> hang on. Oh. He he, one hundred percent. You know, started out uh, his Nothing. business being the brewer, but yeah. he moved out of that pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and he doesn't brew beer anymore. You know, he's the face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he gets to drink beer, so yeah. that's important. Well, it's like Stanley and Marvel. Beer. Marvel, at the end of his life, literally just paid Stanley to be Stanley because he's just so awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, like. That's that. That's kind of the goal. I mean, if you could be that for your own brewery, I would love to be <laughs> be that. All right. So I don't think we have topic time. To go, I don't think we have time to go into topic two. Uh, let's go into just do Q and A's. Um, topic two, by the way, was going to be how to scale up slash down your batches. Um, that's a really big topic, but it's yeah. a topic that I feel like is going to take us until like ten forty to finish. And uh, right yeah. now, if someone were to try to come in, we technically are open, so we have to let them in. We have to shut down the, the live stream. So I don't want to get into that today. We will do. Can we get an NBC for every siren? Um, I mean, we're kind of on that pace, but <laughs> but let's go ahead and go into some Q&A. Let's find some questions that we really love. Um, um, Jim I've seen a lot of good questions. Threw one out. I actually really like this. What if uh, other breweries excel at certain styles? Would having multiple brewers reduce at, uh, no, sorry, brewers, not breweries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, would uh, multiple brewers reduce a house taste or would there still be something similar throughout? I feel like there's a pride, uh, um, kind of a pride aspect to this question. And in which case, if you had multiple brewers, let's say one brewer is really good at sours, one brewer is really good at lagers, and one brewer is really good at IPAs. For example, I feel like just knowing every brewer that I know, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of brewers, if they were all the face of the business, if they started a business together, each of them would think that they could also excel at the other style that the other brewers were doing and kind of, I think it's better to have one brewer who excels at the system and the system is what's important, not the styles. And then they kind of work around the different styles. So there, there's, there's no way that three people would come together and have to work on brewing their each individual styles. Especially if you look at like, if they just opened up and like if a strong majority of the sales were like just the IPAs, then yeah. those other two brewers that were making the sours and lagers, I mean, I wouldn't feel good if it yeah. was me. And so <laughs> I think it'd be very difficult to manage that. Yeah. I think it's uh, more important to have that one, that one person yeah. focus. Yeah. There could be three people creating recipes. Um, that Coaching, would, it could be, yeah, it could be handy. That's actually something that yeah. we do here. Um, yeah, sour guy's really good at accounting, and uh, uh, lager guy's really good at marketing, and then you've got, you've got a whole team. Then you've got a whole team. <laughs> Uh, exactly, 100%. Uh, you know, it, 
to answer your specific question, yes, you would lose a house taste because you would actually have three different uh, process <laughs> styles coming through. So it's better to have a process brewer, or a head brewer who brews everything, even if they don't necessarily make all the recipes. Somebody said if a customer walks in, just put them on the podcast. <laughs> there we go. Uh, if IBUs aren't a thing, then why can you over hop a beer? Uh, there's a lot of ways you can overhop a beer. So mm -hmm. first of all, the number one way that I see it is slightly oxidized hops being used as a big whirlpool addition, which gives you a distinctly planty bitter taste. The other way is I see hops not being filtered back out after infusing their oils, which means the plantiness again becomes an issue. It's overly grassy and you've got that distinct taste. Um, IBUs as over IBUing a beer is different than over hopping a beer. And I have seen beers that are like literally pallet wrecker. There was a, who made pallet wrecker? Was that gr uh, Green Flash. Green Flash mm -hmm. made pallet wrecker. And that was by all accounts, that was an over IBU'd beer, but it was a beautiful beer. It was delicious. 100%, the name is right. It wrecked your pallet. Yeah. Uh, IBUs and the bitterness can actually numb your palate, numb your taste buds to certain flavors. Mm -hmm. And the first couple of drinks were hard. They were rough. Yeah. They were aggressive. And then after that, the beer was so beautiful. But you could not drink anything else after that. It, you yeah. had to stick with Palette Wrecker. So that's different than over hopping, though. Yeah. 100%. IBUs mean nothing other than if you really want to go for an over IBU'd beer. That takes a lot of technical equipment. Over hopping is way different. All the harsh flavors from the plant matter on the homebrew scale are going to come into effect a lot more than the IBUs. Yeah. So. Could be a longer answer, so I don't know, but planning stages of a new brewery, want to start with a three barrel system. Advice, I would first say, at a minimum, start with a three barrel system. I would not start any smaller than that. It's possible, but you're gonna be brewing literally constantly, and you're gonna need like 20 fermenters. What are you trying to say here? <laughs> hire, hire someone who loves to brew and they yeah. want that to be the main part of, their, part of the job and also works the tap room. So you can't. <laughs> and at, the live at, stream. Yeah, at, yeah, exactly. At that scale, you cannot hire a specific brewer. Yeah. But if you can hire somebody who wants to take care of all yeah, the beer everything. and then also work the tap room, then you could probably make it work. Um, but you're going to be brewing a lot if you are successful. If you're, if you're, you know, if you're barely making any money and you're really, really slow, then it's probably manageable by yourself and you can live off the tips maybe if you're working the tap room and making your own beer but mm -hmm. ideally you want that to be a growth model with any mm -hmm. brewery i think you want to you want to have a growth model yeah um, um, i don't want to do the same thing for the rest of my life so yeah I just nope. some people don't it also well, goes in golfing yeah, yeah it goes into that too how much of a life do you want to have if <laughs> Yeah, if you're uh, making it, I mean, if you want to have uh, a small system and run it all yourself, you're only open Fridays and Saturdays, super easy to do. I mean, that, mm -hmm. we see that all the time. You can be super specialty in that, but just keeping in mind, like, you're working two jobs yeah. to do that. So, Apartment Brewer, Super Chat. Ooh, yeah. Thank you, Apartment Brewer. You're awesome. Great having um, you on here, would you, as always. Would you suggest food with your tap room? Mm. Um, somebody says, why would you not? There are reasons not to. Uh, the cost of adding in a kitchen is drastically higher, so your startup costs are going to be a lot more. Um, labor costs are going to go up. Um, it's, it adds a whole other dynamic to the, the business. However, it's still highly recommended. Um, Genus is lucky. There's a pizza place right next door. Where I am opening as well, there's a pizza place next door. Um, however, breweries are, can be successful without having food. I mean, it, it's a whole other dynamic where people eat and they're going to drink a little more and you're going to make some more income. But I'm pretty sure Fremont doesn't have any food. Um, and they do very well. Yeah. So there's reasons for that. There's reasons okay, to guys. do it. There's reasons to not. Um, so we, right. we're, we're getting customers we coming customers. in. Um, you you, you got to decide on your model for that. It's more of a personal choice. But you know hey um daniel there's, I, there's one more, more yeah there's one more daniel is hitting on it that we're doing all right for a one barrel system yeah. let me tell you i am brewing four days a week <laughs> yeah. and working the tap room doing beer sales <laughs> and a lot of other stuff we're not saying it's impossible no. it's a hell of a lot of work i have a one barrel system <laughs> all right guys this is why i say start with a three yeah, yeah. it's so much work and if you're not going to be the head brewer 
Uh, fresh star strawberries as an adjunct, you could use it in the mash. I normally use the strawberries at the tail end of fermentation. I love the flavor mm -hmm. there. In the mash, when it boils, uh, sometimes I find that you can lose some good aromatics, but you can lose them in both uh, space. All right. Uh, all right. A few uh, more questions. Ask them next week. Sorry. Yeah, we'll try we and go back today, and get through a couple of them. Thanks for tuning in. Follow, uh, smash the like button. Follow our uh, YouTube. Follow Genus Not Brewing. Like all of our Instagrams <laughs> for social medias and all that kind of stuff. Especially this if is, you like swords. Yeah. This is Damon from No Drought. Go like No Droughts. Thanks for tuning in. Cheers. Did you answer Reverend Cray Y yep. and the apartment? Yep. yep. We did. Thanks, we guys. Did. I appreciate you all. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Very, uh, yeah. Deuces. All right. I got a busy day. I got to go change for that juicy. <laughs>